Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a week past Sunday special with me David Hooks. Uh, I wasn't going to do a video this week because I'm absolutely stuffed with the cold, so you'll have to forgive me for that. Uh, but all the stuff with the 4th Road Bridge has really been annoying me and I've done an awful lot of reading on it. So I wanted to do a little bit of a video here to just let you know about the kind of things that I've discovered. I've just finished watching the Reporting Scotland piece, or as some people call it, Distorting Scotland. And unfortunately on this occasion... It was a pretty bad report. Uh, it didn't really cover a lot of the things that I've found over the course of my investigation. So, I wanted to take you back to 1964 when the bridge was first opened. So, the bridge was opened by the Queen, and when the Force Road Bridge was first built, it was actually the longest uh, span bridge in Europe of its kind. Uh, it was fourth largest in the world, with the other three being in America. Uh, of particular note at the time was the fact that the the conditions under which the other three bridges, the ones in America, were built, were particularly more benign uh, or than the, the ones which were in Scotland. So there were concerns about the, the winds and the, the type of uh, weather that the, the bridge would have to put up with over its years. So obviously maintenance would have been key. There were also concerns based on what happened to the bridge in Japan, which shook itself to bits. Uh, so there was strengthening put in place to, within the design. But there's been evidence over the years that the design of the bridge wasn't particularly effective uh, and some of the, the work that's been done recently has shown that the, the bridge wasn't actually built according to plan in certain key areas. But we'll get more on that later. So for the first around 30 years of its life, the bridge started to experience much more traffic than was ever anticipated and was ever designed to cope with. The British roads also had the maximum uh, maximum weight of a vehicle doubled to up to 44 tonnes, which again the, the bridge was never really designed to, to actually cope with. So in the 1990s there was a bunch of re uh, strengthening work which was done, um, and a, a lot of investigation was done on the, the actual state of the bridge, and it was found that it wasn't in quite as nice a state as they, they would like it to be. So some work was done and a lot of money was spent, let's, let's not hide that fact. Uh, but when you get to 2004, we start to find that the, the main cables were looked at and opened up and investigated in a way which had never really been done before. It's very difficult and expensive and uh, problematic, but it was crucial to be done because some corrosion had been found at the, the Fourth Road Bridge's sister bridge, the Severn Bridge. And lo and behold, quite considerable corrosion was found here as well, and it was found that the bridge had suffered roughly 60 years worth of corrosion for its only 40 years of life. So there was a huge plan put in place to try and mitigate against this. Now, Alex Salmon described this somewhat unfairly as a glorified hairdryer. What it actually was was a genius piece of engineering whereby the cables were wrapped in neoprene and dehumidified air was pumped into the cables, hence drying them out. Uh, and it was found over the course of the years that this project actually was a, a huge success. There was also money spent on the bridge to put in an acoustic monitoring system, which was a world first, and this was designed to, to help identify breakages when they were happening very quickly so that they could then be repaired. Now, as you can imagine, in amongst all of this, there's an awful lot of work uh, which is being looked at, and there are various parts of the bridge which are being looked at at any one given time. The truss end links, which people have been talking about recently, and you'll have probably seen in the videos that I've posted on my timeline described exactly what the truss end link was and from memory it's be, it's the part which holds the bridge onto the towers everything else obviously being held by the suspension cables now there is accusations that this work was first discovered as being necessary in 2009 and it's true to say that in the reports from feta which is the fourth uh, estuary transport authority which who previously ran the maintenance of the bridge from their meeting in 2009, there, were, there is mention of the truss end links work and the necessity to look at them. But what they said in that meeting was that given the, the cost and difficulty and potential disruption to, to bridge users of carrying out a full replacement of the truss end links, which would have cost somewhere between 10 and 15 million pounds and necessitated the closing of the bridge, despite what some people online seem to claim. Uh, so it was decided to, to look at other options, and it, yes, there was a financial element to that, but it's worth remembering that the strengthening work which was de later identified at a cost of £400,000, which was cancelled in 2010, 
that the 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 budget which was given to Feta in 2010, despite the fact that the BBC reported it had been cut, and it had, they had reserves of over two and a half million pounds, which was more than enough to pay for the strengthening work, and yet it was cancelled. Now this is not the fault of the SNP. This is a decision taken by the Feta board. That decision was taken primor primarily because they wanted to ensure that the cable work which was being done at the time was finished and concentrated on first. They wanted to make sure the outcome of that was positive before they went on to take out, taking on any more significant works which could uh, end up cost costing much more money than was originally planned. Now, the BBC report on Reporting Scotland suggested there were numerous indications in the intervening years. However, reading through the, the FETA meeting reports, between 2009 February and October 2013, there was not one mention of the truss end links. Work was, was obviously ongoing on the cables and there were discussions on various other things that were happening with the, the, with the bridge over that time period. There were other maintenance works which were discussed, but the truss end links were not brought up once. They were mentioned again in the, in the uh, 2013 October report where they looked at the capital spending and it was at this point where they identified that the strengthening work had been looked at and they were happy to go ahead with this which again seemed to be cancelled or, or deferred later on. And again, this was, this was supposedly due to funding. But we're talking about £400,000 here. The, the FETA budget was more than enough to be able to cope with that. And in fact, if you look through the, the, the amount of money which had been allocated to that project over the time, there should have been enough funding there to actually cover it. But it wasn't done, and that had its own reasons, and that was pushed forward. But the strengthening work on the truss end links did start uh, at the start of this year and I believe that the, there was a successful trial which was finished in May and as you may be aware the FETA board was due to be dissolved and a decision taking on the rest of the works after that had happened and that's exactly what did happen. Amy have gone in, they've started looking at the work and they are continuing on with the strengthening work which was originally planned back in 2013. So it's not really fair to say that the SNP knew everything, that the SNP cut the budget, the SNP did this, the SNP did that. What is worth remembering is that this was a board which was made up in 2009 of predominantly Liberal Democrat and Conservative members, with three SNP members, and in the 2013 board that was predominantly Labour members, with of course Liberal Democrats and SNP as well. So when you have the opposition party saying they want to know who knew what when, well, they did there and then because they were in the room at the time. It's very frustrating to have people like Blair McDougall constantly uh, tweeting stuff online where whenever you challenge them and actually show some of the minutes from these meetings which discuss the actual detail of what was being looked at, and he goes silent. This seems to be the case for several of the, of the, the proponents of the, the anti-SNP law, where when you simply put a few facts in front of them, they either run away or just accuse you of wanting to defend the SNP no matter what you do. Now I'm not here to defend the SNP. I may end up doing that on several occasions because they, end, because they are repeatedly accused of things for which they have either no responsibility or no ability to change. Yes, they are accused of things of which they should have done and, sh and have done which they shouldn't have on many occasions and I am quite happy to argue that case if and, and when it does happen. But when it comes to something like the Fourth Road Bridge closure, the rush to blame the SNP before even looking at what had happened shows that Labour will jump on any bandwagon that they can. I've investigated this quite a lot. I've been through every single minute of every single meeting for the, for the six years intervening between the February 2009 and April 2015. One of the, m the main interesting facts that I found was that in the, the last meeting, the April meeting of FETA, which was supposed to uh, have the Barry Colbert's report on the truss end links, there is no such report on the website and the minutes for that meeting are missing. Hopefully that will be resolved at some point relatively soon. But it's, it's crucial to remember the timeline and the timeline which is posted on the BBC report suggests that over the years there were several indications of being problems with the truss end links and they bring up the, the email which was sent in February to suggest that somehow this was a new thing. Well the simple fact is they were working on the truss end links in February so it makes perfect sense to say that you're not going to allow any abnormal loads over the bridge at that time. Now it's also crucial to remember that in that specific email they were talking about excess abnormal loads. 
So that's between 44 tonnes and 150 tonnes is an abnormal load. Over 150 tonnes is an excess abnormal load. Anyone wanting to cross the bridge with that kind of load has to en engage with Transport Scotland before they'd be able to do so. And out of the 842 abnormal load crossings last year, not one of them would fall into this category. So again, it's disingenuous to try and suggest that an email sent in February informing a Labour member of the FETA board that a decision was being taken to not allow excess loads over an area of the bridge that was being worked on at the time is somehow magically admission that things were wrong and nothing was, was going right with the bridge. The final thing to remember is that once this issue was discovered, the bridge was closed within 24 hours. Amy have a design solution within a week. The design solution has already been manufactured. They are working on different areas of the bridge while it's closed. They have even gone to resurfacing parts of the road on the, on the way up to the bridge since the bridge is closed. And the bridge looks as though it's set to reopen on the 4th of, of January as per originally anticipated. Now if that happens, if we get to the 4th of January and the bridge reopens, if investigations show that the SNP and the Scottish Government, as they were, funded FETA properly, that nobody in the, in the uh, Transport Ministry was made aware that there was any kind of potential for any literal failure and closure of the bridge based on a a crack in the truss end links. If none of that information is available, then it shows that once again, all Labour have done is made a fool of themselves. Had they said, we want to know what happened, we think there may have been some mistakes made, we want to investigate the actual facts of the matter before we make any, any accusations, fine, no problem. But they didn't. They just simply jumped straight on to SNP bad, SNP wrong, they cut funding, they've done everything wrong. Unfortunately for Labour, all of the information that I've given you today is in the public domain. Every single piece of it is, is available for you to go online, search it, I'll put links to it on my website, every single piece of it. So go look through the minutes yourself, go and look for any mention of the truss end links being a, a major concern and that something was going to crack immediately. Yes, there was talk of long-term structural integrity of the bridge, but long-term structural integrity is not it's going to break, break in three years if we don't do something about it now. No indication that anybody at any point ever said this bottom part of the truss end link was in danger. I want to deal with one final thing before I go. And that was the issue of whether Derek Mackay misled Parliament or not. Now, the quote which was put out by Blair McDougall was talking about how Derek Mackay answered the question in Parliament to say that the work which we, the member had identified would not have altered the piece which is broken. And then on the following day, on the radio, he said that had the full replacement taken place, then the piece which is currently broken would have been replaced. The work which was cancelled in 2010 was work to strengthen the trusses, not to replace them completely. It was work to strengthen the top part of the trusses, which had been identified as being under overstressed, overstressed, sorry, under certain loading conditions. Not all the time, not constantly, not every day, under certain loading conditions. So that's what had to be looked at, that's what had to be dealt with. That was that work was cancelled despite there being funding available, so that's the reasons for that I've already explained. That's because there were other work going on at the time and they wanted to make sure that that was completed. The full replacement work on the truss end links was not due to happen due to the difficulty and the potential disruption to, to road users. And that would only have been looked at if the strengthening work was deemed to have failed, which as we know from June this year, the strengthening work did not fail, was successful and is currently underway on the rest of the truss end links. So there we have it folks, yet again more, more misinformation which is coming out unfortunately from our state broadcaster who you would expect slightly better of. I know some people may consider me to be biased and that's fine, that's entirely up to you, but I invite you to go and look at the, these meeting minutes for yourself. All the information is there, it's all on my Twitter timeline and I'll put it on the website. Thanks very much for watching, apologies it's been so long but this has been quite annoying the last couple of days and I hope that this information has been useful to you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.